This Christianity thing is a real rags to riches story with a riches to rags twist. It's a riches to rags story like Cinderella going from ashes to ball gowns, from servant to princess. It's like David going from shepherd to king, like Gideon transformed from coward to warrior, like Annie the orphan becoming Annie Warbucks, like Luke discovering the heritage of the force, or Rapunzel finding out she's the lost princess. There is something that happens with us, in us, for us, when we start this, this, this life, abundant life that God has given us. See, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The true light that gives life to everyone came into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through Him, the world did not recognize Him yet. Yet to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that is the rags to riches story. Those of us who are outcast are invited in. Those who are enemies are made families. Those who are orphans are made sons. Those who had nothing are made heirs. Heirs with Christ, co-heirs with the Savior. It is the real rags to riches story that all starts with the riches to rags twist. When God himself came down to us, when God took on flesh and dwelt with us, all hail the incarnate deity, the deity in form as us. And so we stand here at Christmas time and worship God because the king took on flesh and became lowly so that we who are broken could become holy, so that we who were alone could be wholly known, known by God and so that we could know him. So come to him, all who are broken, come to him, all who are lost, come to him, all who are alone, who are worried, who are orphans, come to him and hear him whisper to you a new name. Hear him invite you into his family. Hear God himself say to you, you are my child. tell the world. In this series, Unlikely Beginnings, we've been asking a lot of questions. The first week we asked the question, why Jesus? Why, why did he have to come as a baby, become a human being baby and die eventually on a cross? Why Mary? Why Joseph? Why, why did he use this Seemingly ordinary, humble couple to do something so incredibly extraordinary through them. And this morning, I want to ask another question. Why us? Why the church? Why did God choose to use us, the very ones <laughs> that messed everything up? To use us to carry the message of hope and salvation to the entire world. Yeah, think about this just for a second. You know, God has shown his hand of power and might through centuries since the very beginning. Think about in Moses' day how he spoke and, and showed himself very clearly and powerfully to the children of Israel. How he spoke to them through a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. Think about this. He sets a mountain on fire and says, I'm God, here I am. Come and hang out with me. He's been speaking to mankind in powerful ways, powerful sure, moves, miraculous it. moves of God all through history. Once Jesus died on the cross and, and this, this message of hope became a reality, he could have set the mountain on fire and said, this is what I've done. Now come all who are weary and heavy laden, I'm going to give you a real rest you don't even know about. He could have done that, but he didn't. That's right. He could have sent an angel to each and every one of us individually and said, all right, I'm going to lay it out for you. Here's what happened. Jesus came, he died, and now he makes his, this life of freedom, this salvation, this hope is available to you only through Christ if you choose to receive him. An angel could show up to you the day you, you turn seven years old and you know better. And this angel speaks to you and clearly shows you what the way of salvation looks like. He could have done that. Think about it. True. Think about what he could have done. The many, many different ways he could have communi communicated to us the message of hope and salvation. But yet, yeah. he didn't do that. True. 
He said, I'm going to give this message of hope to people, my people, to the church. And I'm going to leave this responsibility on them to share the story, to pass along the message, to instill faith in others and to use them as an invitation to call people to come to me. He chose us. He chose us. How unlikely is that? Yeah. Why did he do that? We're going to ask that question today. We're going to seek some answers, answers through his word. Let's pray today. Father, unveil your word to us. God, open your word and show us, God, as you open up our hearts, that we would receive what it is that you would have to say to us, your people, the very ones who messed it all up. Speak to us and show us, God. Show us, Lord, why us? Show us what our responsibility is in all of this and how each and every one of us play a part, a role in this greater plan for you to save the world. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. So here's the question, why us? I was thinking about it when Brad and I were preparing for this and I'm like, you know, I don't know that I've ever really stopped to think about this, but God could have done anything, just like Brad said. He could have done anything anything way better than us you know what i mean he could have used his power and supernatural ability in a way that would have really caused people to open their eyes and to understand that god is who he says he is that he wants a relationship with you that jesus really died for you i remember when i met brad him telling me the story of how he came to know god he had been out of church he'd grown up in and out of church as a kid right Mm -hmm. yep and so at 19 years old he was living in jefferson city And he wasn't in church. He was far from God at that time in his life. Brad, how did you come to know about the church? So I was... uh, It wasn't an invite card, was it? No, it wasn't an invite card. It was... uh, I I had a business, and I was pushing real hard in this business to to make things work for myself, but I was so miserable and so, so very, very unhappy. I was... In those days, they had Kinko copy stores. You guys remember those Kinkos? He's dating himself. I'm dating myself. Do they even have those anymore? No, I don't don't think think so. so. No. No, now that we have technology. So, um, <laughs> so I was at a business store. I was having copies made, and, um, and this, this girl just starts talking to me. Like, you know, when you're, you're kind of to yourself, and you really, um, somebody just starts talking to you, and you don't know them, and you're like, stop talking to me. I, you're weird. I don't know you. Why are you talking to me? And but this girl would not, she wouldn't leave it alone. She just was talking to me, really, you know. I, and, I'm, and so, I, interesting, she's, she's got crutches. She's about my height. She's a very, very tall woman. And about my age, and, uh, and she was just going on and on about her church. And honestly, I've been praying. I've been saying, God, I, I have fallen so far from you. I'm so out of whack. My life is so jacked up. I got I to get back in your house. And Lord, just help me find a church. That was my prayer. And so she will not shut up about her church. And I'm thinking, while she's talking how awesome this church is, I'm thinking, I wonder if they'd let me play something, <laughs> you know? And while she's talking, I said, you think they, um, they need musicians? She's like, oh, yeah, they're always looking for musicians. They would love for you to play, you know, and, and you got to come, you got to come. And so she's just really, really working it, you know. She's like, you got to come to this church. I've been going there for years. I love this church. I'm there every time the doors are open. you got to come. I'm like, all right, all right, I'll come. I'll come this Sunday. So she wrote down the information of the church, gave me the phone number and the name of the church. So I called. I, I still didn't know Jeff City that well, so I called and got directions from one of the pastors, and they said, man, we'd love to see you. Uh, when I got there that morning, they treated me like royalty, like I thought, has this church ever had a newcomer? Because they are acting really, <laughs> really weird right now. They're kind of freaking me out. Man, they, they treated me like I'd been there for years. I loved it. The music was incredible. Fell in love just immediately with this church and with the family. Incredible. So I started attending this church, and, you know, honestly... You'd think that I would have thought of this sooner, but about three years in, I'm heavily involved, man. I'm, I'm joining the serve team. I'm there every time the doors are open. I'm serving, serving, serving. Anything I can get my hands on, I just want to be used by God. And it occurs to me one day, and I said, I said to, to the pastor, I said, you know, what's really strange is this, this girl invited me to this church, and I don't know why I never thought about it, but I've never seen her. <laughs> <laughs> He's a little slow. I'm a little slow. Well, I I love the church. It was great. I never thought one more thing about this girl. And I thought, here I am, two and a half, three years in. This girl was going on and on and on about how she goes to this church every time the door, she's always there. I mean, she was like, she was giving me details about this church. She wasn't there the day I visited. She wasn't there the next week, the next Wednesday. 
Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday for three <laughs> years. This girl never showed up to this church. And I'm thinking, she gave me the name of the church and she gave me the phone number. Is this lady a quack or what? Well, guys, the Bible says be careful how you treat people because you may just be entertaining angels unaware. I'm convinced. You can't talk me out of it. There's absolutely no way this girl wasn't an angel. I know that God sent her because my life was a wreck. And I needed God to do something big to get my attention, to reroute me and get me in God's house and get me around God's people, even if it took him sending an angel. He might as well took a two-by-four and just whacked me across the head to get my attention. I'm glad he chose an angel. But that's how he got me to get in his house. So I wanted to share that because, you know, God could have done anything. You know, some of you might have been invited by an angel, some of you by an invite card. It doesn't make any difference. The message of hope that God chose to share For whatever reason, he chose you and me to be a part of that. Now, there's a few different theories. When you study this out, and you may never have even thought about it, okay? But if you've ever studied it out, there's a few theories, and I'm going to share just four of them with you, that theologians think maybe this is why God did this. Now, I kind of think it's humorous even when we as people, humanity, try to figure out why God did something. If it's not black and white, because (laughs) obviously... We're probably off, right? I mean, you think about your life, you try to figure things out, God totally does it a different way, right? But here's, here's a few theories. One is this, that he wanted to prove to Satan that humanity would actually love him, not because of what he could do for them, but who he was. And this theory comes from the idea that when Job was a righteous man, you read about Job in the book of Job, you got it right there? Satan goes before the throne of God and he accuses this righteous man named Job. And one of the things that he says is, you know what? He's only righteous because you have blessed him. Take everything away and he will curse you and die. But if you know the story of Job, and if you don't, you should look it up and read it. He didn't do that. God took everything. He gave Satan permission. He said, you don't touch him. You can't take his life. But you can destroy his life, basically. He lost all of his children all of his wealth. I mean, he lost everything. But in the end, you know what Job did? He still remained righteous. And he still continued to love God. So that's one of the theories. Another theory is that God wanted to be glorified. And the way that he chose to do it is by taking the most unlikely candidates, which is you and me, and allowing us to carry the message of salvation around the world. And that is highly unlikely. The third one is this, that he wanted sinners to share with other sinners how we needed our sin forgiven. Because sometimes it is easier, honestly, if you're in the same boat, if you've ever been an alcoholic, if another alcoholic tells you how they overcame alcoholism, you might actually relate better than someone who's never taken a drink, right? So that's a theory. The fourth one is this. God wanted to give humanity a sense of purpose in living on the earth. Mm -hmm. While they were here during this time, living and breathing, that we would have a sense of purpose. Now, you know what? Any one of those four theories, they might be right. Who knows? Who knows? They could totally be wrong. And I think by the time I get to heaven, I thought, you know what? I think I'll ask God. We're going to forget all about it. But I think the (laughs) second I see Jesus, I'll forget that I even ever cared. But you know what? Here's what's interesting. Though we don't know why God chose us to be a part of his story, We don't know why God chose humanity to be the ones that would share the message of hope. What we do know is why Christ came. And that's what this whole series has been about. And if you haven't been here for the whole thing, I'll tell you this is part three. We have done part one and two, and you really should go back, check them out. We've got them on all of our YouTube, podcast, Facebook, anything out there, you'll probably find us on it. But you should really go back and get yourself caught up. I want to tell you that from the very beginning, when he chose to send Jesus into the world, we told you in week one why he came. He came to purify the bloodline. What bloodline? The human bloodline, because it had been contaminated the moment sin entered the world. And in that very moment, he set into motion this plan that we talked about in the beginning that he actually had thought of long before he even created the world. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And notice, even in this moment, when when Adam and Eve have sinned, how he now is putting this plan into motion. It says this, And I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, what 
in the world does that mean? <laughs> Here's what it means, all right? From that moment, there was going to be a hatred between Satan and humanity. From that moment... Satan was going to try to bring down humanity. He was going to try to cause all of humanity to sin. Why? Because sin separates you from God. In that moment, God allowed him to have this deep hatred towards the very people that he created and loved. And this end part is so awesome. It says this, He shall bruise your head. Another better way and a better interpretation is he shall crush your head. Who's he? Jesus. This is Genesis chapter 3. This is the very beginning of creation. And he's prophesying, God is prophesying to Satan himself. And he says, hey, he, my son Jesus, is going to crush your head. And then the end part says, and you'll bruise his heel. Like you will give him like a little bee sting. You know what I mean? But in doing so, he's going to crush you when he overcomes death, hell, and the grave. And I work out my plan and I bring redemption for all humanity. So he from the he very, told him right out of the chute. Exactly. He said, I'm going to kick your butt. That's right. It's not going to be today. That was an English interpretation. It's not going to be tomorrow, but it is gonna happen. going to happen. So get ready. Now, now, do you ever, as a parent, you ever send your child to your room to get the whipping? To their room. To oh, their your room. room. Oh, send them to your room. I guess That's you could go worse. either way. Now, you send them in their room. That's, I think, the worst part for me as a child. My sister says I didn't get beat very much, but I did. I got my. I Probably got my, needed more. Iron. When my dad would send me to my room, he would let me sit in there and bake for a long time before he would ever come through that door. That's and it made it worse. I, I'd rather, Dad, just come in and beat me. Get, get it over done. with. Let's get go. it over with. I know I deserved it. Let's just get this done. But no, he'd make me sit there for an hour. That was like car and rides. And that was horrible. That's like car rides. If you have a large family, I had five siblings in my family. And if anybody was fighting in the car, one of two things happened. Either mom had a switch on the dash, all right? And if she could reach you, you were getting that. And if you couldn't, it was when we get home. That's right. So you that's what this it. prophecy was doing. God was saying, it's not going to be today. It's going to be thousands of years from now. I'm going to let you now. cook for a while, buddy. And then you're going to get it. You're going to get crushed. That's if right. you look in 2 Corinthians 5 and 15, check out this, this passage. He says this, and he died for all. Who's he? Jesus. All right. Jesus died for all. This is so important, guys, because I'm going to show you in a second in the Christmas story how God reveals this exact thing. He says, for he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for who? Themselves. themselves. This is an interesting revelation right here. But for him who died for them and was raised again. See, here's what's interesting. God knew from the very beginning that humanity would be selfish. That we would naturally want to do what we want to do. But this passage says that when he died, Jesus died for all. Not that we would go on living for ourselves and doing what we want to do and having all of our own hopes and dreams come to fruition, but rather that we would live for him, Jesus, who had died for us. Now, I want you to look at this Christmas story with us. We've been going through this in the last couple of weeks, and I want you to think about how through this story God showed that he came for all. I'm doing this because in my Bible, I circled all, all right? <laughs> I sometimes do things, we and I start think, doing that. that makes no sense. Yeah, circle. But I circled the word all in my Bible and on my notes. All right. Look at the mom and dad. Last week, we talked about the unlikely parents <clears throat> of Jesus, Mary and Joseph. We told you a little bit of history about these guys. They were Jewish by blood, Okay. So the prophecies in all the Old Testament, what it said was this. A Messiah will come. He will be king of the Jews. Jews. All right? He's going to be king of the Jews. So in the Jews' minds, they were the only people. The only people that the Messiah was coming for was just for them. To deliver them from their persecution. To bring them peace. Only for them. Yet the passages of scripture that we read say he came for all. So then think about the next part of the story. As soon as Jesus is born, his announcement is made by angels to who? The poorest people in the entire region. Who were they? The shepherds. They were poor, very, very poor, living out in the fields. Imagine yourself living in the fields. How often do you think you get to bathe? How often do you think you get to go clean up and put on some clean clothes? These guys were poor. They were probably looked down on by almost everybody in society. And yet, God chooses to reveal this incredible miracle, the Messiah's birth, to the poor. Then think about it. Today, we're going to talk a little bit 
I just moved my mic. Just a little bit about somebody you've obviously heard about because we sing songs about all of these people, and I think we add to the story, Hmm. okay? So you know these guys as the three wise men. The reason I say you add to the story is who said there was three? Did you know the Bible doesn't say that? It doesn't say that at all. We, our humanity, we like add to the story. How many's got a family member who adds to the story? No. Just to make it a little bit better. I make stories better. You make stories up. You take a little bit, make them good. If you stretch something, it's not lying. Okay. Improving upon it. Be careful. We got a lot of kids in this room. All right. (laughs) So look with me at Matthew. We're going to look at these visitors from the east, known as wise men. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, and it says this. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men, see, it doesn't say how many. Some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is this newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it arose, and we've come to worship him. They entered the house and they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure's chest and they gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I don't know what baby shower you have ever been to in your life where a baby got gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But I'm going to tell you in a little bit why they did that and how awesome it really is. But I want you to look at a couple things right out of the chute. These guys, one of, we don't know, there could have been 10, 12, 20, there could have been three. We don't know. But these guys, what we do know, they're pagans. All right? They're not Jewish. Very important when we talk about he came for all. They are Gentiles. Okay? So if you're not a Jew, everybody else in the entire world, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So I am a Gentile. We tie that? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm going to be slinging it around. Everybody's going to be watching me the whole day. Tie it tight. What's a Gentile? A Gentile is not a Jew. What's a Gentile? I'm talking to you. What's a Gentile? (laughs) Come on, you're like my children. I'm talking to you. All right. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. These guys were pagan Gentiles. They did not serve God. But notice what it said. They came to worship the newborn king. What that shows us, guys, is two things. They were rich because of the gifts that they brought, and they were Gentiles. So Jesus came for all. He came for the Jews, he came for the Gentiles, he came for the poor, and he came for the rich. God shows us this strategically in this one little moment in time when Jesus is born. Now you look at the gifts that they were given. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We know when we study out the word that one, he came to be king of the Jews. Do you know what a gift fitting for a king was? Gold. The reason that he was brought gold is this was all prophetic. He was brought gold as a gift to say this is the king, all right? This is is King Jesus. Frankincense, do you know what frankincense was? It was an incense. And one time in this room, Brad and I burned incense. There's still burn marks. In a message kind of like this. And there are burn marks right here on the carpet. They're still there. We had just laid the carpet. It had been about a month, okay? And we rolled into this season and we we were talking about frankincense and the incense that burns in the burn in the worship down. and we had now we don't burn incense at home okay we burn scentsies so you don't burn them you just put them in the pots okay a little plug for all the scentsy girls so we brought in incense and i didn't know i mean i wanted to make a statement to all of you because we want to be creative in the way we present something it was so we had all of these little jars and we lit up all these incenses okay and we're talking about how the incense was, an, um, was like a form of worship in the tabernacle, and it rises, and all of a sudden, Realm it's of our rising. Praises. And we're Half running. Up, uh, <coughs> we're like alarm's going to go off, and people are like. <coughs> people in the crowd, it was like I could barely see you. There was this fog Ace, everywhere. And I was like, church oh, my is. gosh. On fire. One girl starts <laughs> coughing so bad. Brad and I finally, like, we opened the side Open door. The side door okay? a little bit. Little, little breeze in. Anyway, at some point while we got excited, the ashes from the incense started yeah, dropping, dropping off, off onto the, the carpet. carpet. And when we were done with that service, I think we only had one back in the day. Can you imagine? Three? Yeah. This whole place would have been filled. It burned holes in the brand new carpet. We were like, on it. Doggone it, but we are creative yes. right there. If you were in that service, do you remember us burning incense? You never forgot, right? That's right. 
Well, incense was used as a form of worship. That's exactly what it was. It was a priestly role. The priest would take the frankincense, they would burn it. And so this was prophetic that not only was he king, but he was also a high priest. Because if you remember in the Old Testament, the only person who could do a sacrifice of the spotless lamb was a high priest. Jesus not only was going to be the sacrifice, he had to be a high priest in order to do that as well. The final thing that you see him being brought is myrrh. And myrrh was an anointing oil that was used during burial to prepare a body that had died for for burial. And so in this, we see this picture of how God says, hey, he's going to be a king, he's going to be a high priest, and he's going to be the sacrifice through just these three gifts. But here's what's also very cool about this story. We told you in the first week, I believe, and maybe in the second, that it wasn't very long after Jesus is born that King Herod, after these wise men come, he wants to murder the newfound king. Why? Because he's afraid of losing his own throne. Okay? He doesn't even care that it's a baby. Joseph is warned by God in a dream, and they flee to where? They flee to Egypt. When they get to Egypt, guess what they don't have? Jobs and money. Or a place to live. But you know what God provided for them? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Which would have allowed them to sell those items and have the money to live mm-hmm. while they were in Egypt those couple of years. Think Does about God this. Think, about, think about it. Think about how amazing God is. Not only is there symbolism, but God even provides then for their most basic needs because he always goes before you and he always prepares you and even right now he has called you to be a part of his story and even though you're thinking to yourself like that is totally unlikely like i'm the shyest person on the planet i can't talk i can't put my words together they don't come out right how could i talk to anybody and tell them about this amazing story well you know what everyone from cover to cover in the word of god felt just like we do how unlikely it would be that god would choose to use me and yet that was what he chose. God is constantly drawing you and calling you to do something that is bigger than you believe you are. That's right. For his glory. And as he, do, as he as does do that, that, as he do that, <laughs> you, need, you need to know that the next season that's ahead of you in your life, as God's calling you to do something bigger than yourself, whoever he calls, he qualifies and he equips. That's right. You're not, when he calls you, you're going to look around and, and you're not going to have what you need, most likely, to do what he's asking you to do. Mm-hmm. But that's why they call it faith. That's right. He wants to stretch you. He wants to mold you. He wants to make you. All the resources aren't always going to be there. The experience isn't going to be there. Yeah. But here's what's important. As God calls you, understand that he's going to equip you. He's going to qualify you. You just got to be faithful. You got to step out and you got to be obedient. Each and every one of us in this room Mm -hmm. are called by God to use our time and our talents to know God and make him known. All right, so we're asking this question, why us? God, why did you choose to use humanity? We are seeing that his plan is twofold. The first fold of that plan is he had to use his son Jesus, who was perfect. Mm -hmm. He died, but he didn't just die for the Jews. Right. Misty made it really clear through the word that he died for everybody, but he didn't just die. If he would have just died and we left him there in the it's grave, he wouldn't be any different than Buddha or Hare Krishna or Muhammad or any of these guys. Mm-hmm. He would be the same as any of them because they all claim to be God. Here's what sets right. Jesus apart from everybody else. The dude came back to life, yo. <laughs> <laughs> that pretty much settles it. Pretty much settles it, right? You he should did, see the faces of your daughters. On came, the front row but right yeah, now. like don't ever <laughs> say yo again, ever. As long as you, it's okay, I can I can try at least. Okay, so he he not only died, but he came back to life. He overcame death, hell, and the grave. That's right. So that was the first part of God's plan to save the world. The second part rests on us. That's right. Right. No perfect people allowed. Right. right? He uses this imperfect people that they've already blown it. They've already messed it up. Now he has to send his son to die so we can have that open invitation to come to him and have life. He leaves it up to us. Right. So what does this look like? I want, I want to take you to the very beginning of this process of the church becoming the church and show you how Jesus laid this out. One day, Jesus is an adult now, okay? He's about 30 years old, we think. And here he is recruiting to build up his team, his staff, 
building a surf of team. 12. He's building a surf team. And this so reminds me of the early days. We had nothing. We had nobody. This was Jesus. He was planting his church. So turn with me, if you would, to Matthew. We're going to go to chapter 4 and verse 18 through 20. And it says this. It says, One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they, they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, and he said, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their, they left their nets. If you're writing your word, <coughs> circle it. They, they left their nets at once, and they followed him. Later in verse, uh, I believe it's 22, says that they left, the, the next two that he recruited, it says that they left their nets and their father, and they followed after him. The word left in the Greek here means divorce. Hmm. They divorced their nets. Their, it wasn't just their nets, I want you to think about. It was their livelihood. Yeah, their career. They had been raised in a boat with their dad, learning how to fish to provide for their families. Hmm. And immediately, at the drop of a hat, they left their careers, they left their family, their, they left their dad and their career, they stepped out of the boat and they followed after Christ to say, you know, they didn't know if, if they would have what they needed. They didn't have the experience. They just knew that Jesus was calling. And that's the call that he's given us today. That's where Jesus started. Right. And here you go. Eventually he's got these 12 guys, then down to 11. And he goes out for three years preaching the word, doing miracles. And before you know it, he, I mean, he goes on the Jesus tour, all right? And he's like Michael Jackson of the day. He's famous all across the land. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people have now come to Christ. And you have the beginning, the inception of what we know today as the church. That's right. The church. And here's what's really cool about this. In Matthew 28, we're going to look at 18 through 20. This is at the end of his three-year ministry. Jesus is about to leave earth. He's, he's already gone to the grave. He's already come alive. And he's been here hanging around. It's kind of creepy, but he's been hanging around in his glorified body for days and days and days. And he speaks his last words to the church. A lot of theologians believe that it wasn't just the disciples that he was talking to, but there could have been about 500 of his followers. Mm -hmm. The church was standing there on the hillside when he makes this final speech. And here's his last words. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It says this, Therefore, I'm sorry, Jesus came and told his disciples, listen to this, I have been given all authority, or you could use power there, in heaven and on earth. God has given him all the power and all the authority in heaven and earth. All right? Therefore, here's what I want you to do. He's speaking to you and I. He's speaking to everybody that was standing on that hillside that day. It wasn't just the 12 guys. That's what you need to understand, or the 11. It wasn't just them. It's all of us who call ourselves followers of the Lord Most High. Therefore, here's what I want you to do. Go. Say go. Go. Go and make disciples. That means we are to make followers of Christ, of all nations, all people, That's right. baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Next verse says, teach these new disciples to obey all. Say all. All. All the commandments I have given you and I will be, sh and be sure of this, I am with you always even to the end of the age. I believe that it was in this same instance that then he said what we can see in Acts 1 and 8. Turn to Acts 1 and 8 real quick. And he says this. He says, but you will receive power. Now what did God give Jesus? In all of heaven and all of earth, he gave him what? Power. power. He gave him authority. Right. He said, you're going to be given this, this same power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. You want to know what that means in the Greek? No, you don't. It Martyr. means martyrs. It means you're going to lay down your life That's physically right. and spiritually. You'll be, you, will, you will be, as a follower, as a, as a disciple, as a witness, I want you to lay it all down. No matter what I ask you to do, be willing to give it all up. Uh, you'll be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the utter ends of the earth. This is what Jesus called us to do. We are to make disciples. We are to take the life-changing message of Jesus Christ and share it around the entire world. That's, That's right. his plan. Jesus did That's his right. part. Now we're to do ours. Romans 10 and 14 says, But how can they, that's, that's those who are not in this church yet, how can they, those people that we, family members, friends, coworkers, how can how can they call on him, Jesus, to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone 
tells them. That's right. You know who that someone is? That's, That's you, baby. That's right. That's you. That's you. And I am so proud of this church. We do an amazing job at inviting people to come to this church. If it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't see the thousands of people. Listen, over the last 24 months, over the last 24 months, we have seen over 2,000 people visit this church for the first time. That's right. Amen. I don't know if you realize that's really not normal. That's not normal at all. You guys are doing a killer job. That's right. But listen, don't stop. Here's my message and my challenge to you. Don't stop. In just a a few minutes as we close today, um, you're going to be encouraged to take these these invite cards. Guys, this is our calling from Christ to make disciples. Invite people like crazy. Next week, we have this Christmas production coming up. Our kids are going to knock it out of the park. I want you, I just want to challenge you, just pray about three people that you know that don't have a church home, that need, that need this real and life-changing relationship right. with Jesus like we have, let's get them here. And let's have them to enjoy this production. And, and because Misty and I are going to bring a word that's going to challenge them and inspire them, and we're going to believe that they're going to come to Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray today. Father, we love you so much. You. God, use us as, as, as your people to, to be that, that, that person, God, who tells someone about who you are. And that, that by the power, by the drawing of your Holy Spirit, you would draw them to this place that they would hear the life-changing message of Jesus. Believing, Lord, that they will never be the same again. Why us? We don't know why you chose to leave your plan of salvation in our hands, but we do know this, God. You did leave it in our hands. We know that you did. We know that we have a responsibility in all of this. Lord, help us to fulfill our part our role for inviting others, inviting our world to come and know you and make you known. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to know, are you one of them that I'm talking about this morning? Are you one of them? You came into this place and, man, you don't, you're not really sure that heaven is your home. You're, you're why we do church and we've been praying for you constantly and we love you and we want to invite you to know Jesus in a real way today. So if that's you, Would you be so bold this morning? I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I just want to know who you are so I can be praying for you. Would you just raise your hand if that's you today? And we want to pray for you. Amen. I see your hand, buddy. Anybody else this morning? Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Anybody else this morning? Thank you. I see your hand, brother. I see your hand. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Two people raised their hand this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Let's pray together as a church family and in love and support of those that have made this decision. Father, I love you. Father, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I need a Savior. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. You are Lord. You are Lord. Help me to be different. Help me to be different. Help me to live by your word. Help me to live by your word. From this day forward. From this day forward. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, if you made that decision today by raising your hand or just in your heart, we have a gift for you. It's called our Next Step Kit. It's in the green bag as you exit on the left by those double doors. Make sure you grab one. This will help you on your newfound journey. Will you guys put your hands together for those who made that decision? That's why we do what we do. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.